I have always called this book a novel because it's, it's an autobiography, but it's full of lies. Now, of course, most autobiographies are full of lies, so there's nothing new there. But um, I had more or less congratulated myself that there were lots of lies in this book. But I have found out there are not enough lies, because when I was preparing this reading, I discovered that there are some very sordid things in this book. And they make you extremely unhappy when you read them, uh, although they make me laugh. Because uh, from a very early uh, period in my life, I learned that if something was so exquisitely painful, you had options. You could cry, you could deny it, or you could laugh. And so I laugh when I feel terrible pain. Yeah. The winter before my father had to go away, it was always snowing, and it never stopped. My mother said it was the worst winter New York ever had. Anywhere else they would be sending out the St. Bernards to rescue all the people that got lost in the snow the way they did in Switzerland when she was growing up. My mother and father said when they were growing up, people always got tuberculosis. They were always scared I was going to catch cold. They said, I was delicate. That's why they made me wear high shoes all the time and eat my supper in bed, even on the days I had to go to school. My mother used to light the lamp and tuck me in and let me sit in my pajamas looking at the picture books my father always brought me or coloring with my crayons while she was getting supper ready. Or I played with my lotto game and matched up all the animals and birds Sometimes, if I got sick and didn't have to go to school, my mother took her special book down from where she hid it in the closet. Its cover was all shiny like patent leather shoes, except you could see the weaving underneath. All the writing had fancy curlicues and bubbles popping everywhere and tiny spurs on it my father said were serifs. Inside were pictures of things like roots and the cells plant have that look like little boxes and all the hungry baby lips leaves have to help them breathe and branches with numbers on them so you could tell where all the stems and leaves were going to pop out and flowers like daisies and eglantines and pigs. My mother even glued an Edelweiss inside, and when you touched it, it felt all soft and velvety. She said it grew high up on the mountain where she climbed to pick it once. Then came the silver apples and golden pears, but I like the plums best of all, all purple and frosty with summer bloom, and the sunlight shining through the leaves just like it did the day long ago when my mother painted them in her mother's orchard. They pushed my mother's writing way into the corner. Maybe that's why after the plums, the rest of the book was empty and my mother didn't write in it anymore. When my mother brought me my tray with my supper on it, I had to close the book and give it back because she didn't want me getting any sticky stuff on it. She said I had to eat without spilling anything because cockroaches were always hiding in the walls, just waiting till they could jump on the stray crumb. After she put the lights out, I would lie in bed shivering, worrying that maybe some tiny crumb escaped. All the spots on the wall started to jiggle like cockroaches running everywhere, hunting for the greasy thumbprint my mother said was all they needed to live on for a year. I lay in the dark waiting for my father to come home, listening to the cars chugging up the hill, fanning light beams across the ceiling, counting the footsteps ringing on the sidewalk, and hearing the street doors squeal open and bang shut and the scrape of garbage pails getting put out for the night. Sometimes I got out of bed so I could see way down the hillside outside, but the window curtains gave off a rusty smell 
and when I pushed them aside, pieces of soot scattered all over the windowsill and got stuck under my fingernails. I would stand for a long time by the window watching the snowflakes flutter and swirl like moths trapped inside the street lights. But when I heard footsteps coming down the hall, I jumped into my bed and threw the covers over my head and breathed loud like people do when they're supposed to be asleep. Out of the corner of one eye, I could see the door opening and the shadow of my father looking at me in the doorway. After a while, he would tell my mother I was asleep. El dor, he would say, and he would close the door softly. Underneath the blankets, I could feel my cheeks get fat because maybe in the daytime, my mother still used to call me baby names like Fifinette or Babette or even Ceci Lola. But at night, when they thought I was asleep, they called me El. It made me feel grown up, almost like I didn't belong to them at all. One time, my father caught me standing barefoot at the windowsill. He said I was supposed to be asleep. It was cold and drafty in my room. And if I kept getting up like that, I might catch cold and have to stay in bed. He said if I ever tried getting up again, he was going to have to smack me. That's when he first told me about memories. Memories live in places where they first happen to you. Some memories could stay long after you jumped inside the covers, maybe even for years and years. My hand brushing aside the window curtains, for example, or the sound of my bare feet. But when you least needed to remind yourself, there came the dusty smell that warned you that a memory was about to replay itself. And that's how he could always tell when I wasn't in my bed because he could still hear the slap of lost footsteps on the floor or even the sound of a misplaced cough. He said there were no secrets, no way of hiding from him because there wasn't any kind of box or place not even where we lived in our big apartment house where you could lock a memory away safely enough to make sure it wouldn't come back sometime and give you away. 